uh, standoff cruise missiles, hypersonic weapons, and of course, drones, huge inventory of ballistic missiles, which they built homegrown. They are producing close to 20, 22 drones a day. How does that co come handy in a conflict, sir? Claiming over 90% success rate. Do you think India should invest in a nice air defense system as well? Akash air defense system, made in India, very successful. It's got its own radar, own missiles. Missiles and radars, I think India uh, is doing well, including in air-to-air -air missiles, we know the Astra, we know the Ramos air-to-grounds. We, we, we are, I think, doing quite all right. Yeah. You know, we bought the C-17, C-130, the P-8I, the Apache, the Chinook, the R-60 uh, helicopter. So one thing we are missing at the moment in, in air power is the fifth generation jets. Pakistanis might manage to get their uh, fifth generation fighter before either us. from China or from Turkey before us and that will be a very embarrassing position. So true, therefore, true. we have to you know, get our act right while we are working towards that Atam Nirbharta, which is crucial. If you right. want to be a superpower, you have to be Atam Nirbhar in defense for sure. There is no doubt about that. So what we require to do is Today, we have the honor of speaking with one of India's most distinguished Air Force veterans, Air Marshal Anil Chopra, a pioneer of the Mirage 2000 fleet, test pilot, and an expert in air power and strategic issues. Air Marshal Anil Chopra brings decades of experience, insights, and vision in military aviation and defense. In this conversation, we dive deep into the future of air defense, the evolving role of drones, and how air power is redefining global conflicts. We discuss how more than 40% of the world's defense budget is now spent on air defense and why aerial warfare continues to dominate modern military strategy. Air Marshal Anil Chopra shares his take on India's advancement in air defense, including the indigenous Akash system and what the future holds for India's air capabilities. We also touch on stealth technology, the future of urban air mobility, and how climate change initiatives are shaping the aviation sector. Air Marshal Anil Chopra offers his thoughts on the latest innovations, the importance of R&D and what advice he would give to his younger self. So whether you're a defense enthusiast, an aviation geek or simply curious about India's strategic power, this episode is packed with insights you wouldn't want to miss. So without further ado, let's get started. Before we dive into today's conversation, I just want you to take a quick moment. We looked at our analytics and noticed that 93% of you who watch our videos regularly aren't subscribed yet. If you're enjoying our content and want us to keep going with more insightful conversation, we'd really appreciate if you could take just a second to subscribe. It might seem like a small action, but it goes a long way in helping us grow and bringing even more amazing content your way. Thanks for your support. It means the world to us. Now let's get back to the video. Air Marshal Anil Chopra, welcome to Dive Publisher. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shivam. Always a pleasure to be with you. Always. Thank you. I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for sparing the time and, you know, coming to Dive Publisher. Really grateful for that. So. Yeah, it's my second opportunity with you. And uh, I'm so happy that, uh, you know, uh, we are going great guns. Yes. Thank you very much. So I'll start our conversation okay. on a very timely subject. We are seeing major conflicts at the moment, Russia, Ukraine, one, the war in West Asia as well. So what is the the dynamics of air power in these conflicts nowadays? Because we see, you know, wars have been fought in a long, long period now and in a distance as well. Yeah, Shiva, I must tell you that uh, immediately after Second World War, the major parts, especially the US and subsequently the Russians, they realized that one who controls uh, aerospace controls this planet. And that has been true now, more recently in the last 20 years. Chinese realized it, India has realized it. Out of the $2.44 trillion that was spent on defense around the world, wow. more than 40% was on uh, air and space. So that is the kind of importance uh, that air and space are. We, as you mentioned, there are two major conflicts going on, one in uh, Ukraine and the second in the West Asia. And in both, the air power, including the space power, has actually, as far as uh, Ukraine is concerned, that before February uh, 22, when the actual uh, invasion took place, effectively, 
the eastern uh, part of Ukraine was already under tacit control of the Russians because of uh, pro-Russia population of that area. A major campaign was required to, you know, annex that region. Right now, for quite some time, barring a little movement, more and less, the front is stabilized. That means around 20% of Ukraine is uh, territory is with the Russians. But the war is continuing. And where is the war taking place? Not much movement on the ground. Mm -hmm. All in the air. Now, of course, we saw in the initial part of the war, uh, you know, space has been used for communications, for intelligence, uh, and uh, there, there have been attempts to jam the satellite links, the jam the GPSs of the weapons of the platforms. And uh, there have been, uh, of course, uh, bulk of the weaponry that has been fired is uh, air-launched cruise missiles right. and drones. We also saw that cruise missiles were used against Moscow, the cruiser, uh, which, which was sunk by the Ukrainians. <coughs> so bulk of the war that is taking place is uh, in the air. And I must also mention that uh, drones, cheap ones, anything between $10,000 to $50,000, uh, they have democratized air war. Why? Because even uh, the cost is so little that even countries with uh, less money, lesser defense production capabilities, even um, non-state actors mm -hmm. like the Hezbollah, the Hamas, yeah. the Houthis, uh, they all have been able to uh, you know, get into war and make an impact. We all know that in the initial part of the Ukraine conflict, there was a death knell being uh, announced for the tank because the top attack uh, uh, drones, kamikaze drones were knocking off uh, sure. tanks. Of course, the tanks subsequently strengthened, uh, uh, put in more armor on the top. Similarly, we have seen uh, drones uh, making attacks deep into Russian territory, including knocking off the ammunition dumps, uh, including knocking off their fuel reserves uh, deep into uh, into Russian territory. So therefore, air and space are dominating, mm -hmm. but the character of war, uh, air war has changed. You know, uh, Russians cannot today fly fighter aeroplanes in Ukrainian territory uh, because of the air defense systems, which are mobile. And many, in the first uh, two months, nearly 50 <laughs> Russian aircraft uh, had been uh, destroyed in the air because of the air defenses. And uh, similarly, the Ukrainians can't go into Russian territory uh, as far as the aircraft are concerned. So there is a term which is now being used called air denial. Mm -hmm. And this uh, term is uh, what is uh, saying that air superiority may not always be possible, but air denial can be possible. And uh, that is uh, how the air war is uh, reshaping uh, mainly because of uh, now what why does it cost you know cruise missiles are expensive but uh, they are less expensive than uh, airplanes mm -hmm. uh, so therefore uh, uh, standoff cruise missiles hypersonic weapons and of course drones uh, uh, drones as uh, in swarms in formation in man on man teaming they will be uh, used in much uh, one other small point i want to mention is that because uh, a lot of these, like a drone swarm, this all related to communication between the drones. Uh, electronic warfare and cyber warfare have gained greater importance. Right. Yeah. So, sir, you spoke about drones and UAVs. Sir, uh, what is the difference between a cheap drone and an expensive drone? Yeah, you know, see, we are uh, we, we are re recently announced that we are going to buy uh, thirty one uh, and to nine. <clears throat> yeah predators from USA, the deal for which we were working for last three, four years. Uh, this deal is going to cost uh, $3.9 billion. Uh, of course, that doesn't, uh, that cost include the ground stations and some of the weapons and other things that we'll be buying with it. And it's for all the three forces. Uh, for, uh, for all the three forces. The Navy is the lead service. They are going to get 15 and True. the yeah. other two services get a little lesser number. Uh, but uh, so I, I'm trying to give you an idea of the cost. Effectively, when you look at only the cost of the drone itself, it's close to $90 million. That's close to the cost of a F-35. Oh, that means 
it's a full fledged aircraft now large uh, you know, drones uh, have uh, their strengths uh, because they can loiter for much longer time they can get uh, they can fly at much higher altitude they will get uh, information they have more sensors they can carry weapons and they will uh, you know be, be very useful for the peacetime isr but in a contested environment whether it was in the black sea whether it's the middle east they're finding more and more of these getting shot up mm -hmm. so you will require the indian navy why indian navy is buying more or getting more is because their requirement of uh, peacetime surveillance of the indian uh, ocean region which primarily is being done right now by PHIs, which is an expensive aircraft to uh, operate for long hours, it can now be done by by large drones like uh, MQ-9. But I must mention that uh, uh, MQ-9, owning MQ-9, maintaining is going to be an expensive. And in, because they move at a much slower speed compared to fighters, uh, they're highly vulnerable uh, during operations. That means uh, if I was to... Uh, try to fly across uh, into the you know adversary's territory the it will get shot up it will be a sitting duck so expensive has its advantage of endurance mm -hmm. long flight can carry weapons but it can be a sitting duck uh, you know in uh, against modern air defense weapons so now look at drones now imagine uh, you could buy 10,000 drones for the same, uh, you know, depending on what's the size of uh, kamikaze drone that you would <laughs> want to buy. Or even if you have to buy small drones uh, to look across the mountain, the battalion commander can look across the mountain to see what the enemy is doing. Then those drones are so much uh, cheaper. And uh, the kamikaze drones, uh, which can have also a reasonably good range, mm -hmm. they could be a propeller uh, engine, could have jet engines, they could be uh, much cheaper, you right. can buy in much large. So ultimately, you need a great combination. I must say oh. that the US Air Force themselves have realized this, and uh, they are investing less and less on large drones and much, much more on smaller drones, yes. So when it comes to cheap drones, Iran is a great manufacturer yeah. and Iran is a, in an active conflict with Israel as well. Yeah. Since we're talking about Israel, we must talk about the air defense system that Israel has. Yeah. How does that co come handy in a conflict? Sir? There are two areas when Iran is doing extremely well. One is they have a huge inventory of ballistic missiles, which they built homegrown. And the American defense establishment, security establishment has been telling the Congress that they perhaps have close to 3,000 ballistic missiles and we all know that uh, on the 1st of October there was a huge attack uh, on uh, Israel they all used ballistic missiles because of the distance and ballistic missile we know that it uh, goes into space and then comes down True. and then hits the target now so uh, the ballistic missile relatively large easier to track mm -hmm. because it has to go to high altitude uh, and the trajectory is such that it is possible to know uh, where is the ballistic missile heading for, which is going to be the target, and so the air defenses must. And the second uh, uh, thing they got is the Shahid 136 drones, mm -hmm. which they, they are producing close to 20, 22 drones a day. That's the level of production. In fact, the Russians have asked them to set up a factory in uh, Russia uh, to build these drones because uh, the Russians have uh, bought a large quantity of these drones are using in Ukraine. Yeah. So, uh, coming back to Israel, now we know the Israelis have got the best, uh, one of the world's best air defense systems, whether it's the very high altitude, long range arrow uh, uh, air defense system, then there's this David Sling, mm. and much closer is the Iron Dome. Uh, and of course, even closer, they have got uh, close in weapon systems, they also have directed energy weapons uh, systems. So Israel knows that they have got uh, threats all around and they were very conscious and right from the word go. Yeah. But they have invested hugely in air defense uh, and uh, the number of iron dome systems they have got is phenomenal. And it, 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 it's a layered air defense, you know, that at different ranges there is a different missile or an interceptor uh, and a different radar that, that's being used. So yes, general figures that come out from the Western sources is that the Israeli air defense systems are doing exceedingly well. They are claiming over 90% success rate. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, this success rate, in case of drones, 
uh, you have to also jam the drone GPS and various, uh, you know, other sensors, including blind the higher head or uh, even their cameras. So a combination of things are required and that's uh, what the Israelis are trying to do. Uh, you must remember that, you know, Iran is, can use ballistic missiles, not easy for them to use cruise missiles because cruise missiles fly at a much lower altitude and mm. they have to fly through other countries right. before they reach Israel. We know that there is a distance and Saudi Arabia and Iran are not great friends uh, and they won't let the, them, uh, you know, fly across. Uh, we also know that the um, uh, Israelis have a great uh, support from the Americans. In fact, Americans and Israelis are working on most air defense projects together. Mm -hmm. It means the same system is being built for I Israel and same is also being built for the US and slight uh, variations on as required, uh, you know, basis. So therefore, uh, and the Americans are sitting in large numbers. They are sitting in Jordan, they are sitting in Saudi Arabia, they are in Qatar, they are in uh, Syria, they are sitting in Iraq, they right. are sitting all over. So there is uh, the, this combination, but yes, the basic point is that Israelis have got a great air defense system, uh, systems, uh, they need them and they need them because uh, of the kind of threat they are facing as a right. small country. Yeah. So even India has threats from a neighborhood, yeah. China and Pakistan. Do you think India should invest in a nice air defense system as well, similar to Israel? I know it's an expensive deal, but do you think it will be important for us to invest in? Yeah, you know, uh, Shivam, we already have clearly invested in large number of air defense systems. Now, let me explain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have our own uh, Akash air defense system made in India, very successful. It's got its own radar, own missiles. We have bought the S-400s from uh, uh, the Russians, uh, we have bought five batteries, uh, out of which three are already delivered. The other two will get delivered shortly because of some technical payment related issues are there. Uh, but very soon we will have off five of them. Also developing our own, um, you know, advanced uh, medium and uh, long range uh, SAMs. Mm -hmm. the medium range SAMs are already under induction. Then there is a long range SAMs. So ultimately we will have SAMs covering up to 360 400 kilometers, which is very good. I think in the next two, three years, we'll have the long range SAM also being inducted. The MR SAM is all leaving. So we have a great program. And of course, earlier we had the SAM 8s, we had the Russian SAM 8s, we had the Pechoras, <laughs> which have done well. We have upgraded them and they are still with the armed forces, all, all the Army, Navy, Air Force. All three of them have got. So therefore, we are uh, very conscious of uh, you know, what we are doing as far as uh, you know, air defenses are concerned. And uh, the program is well in place. We are also doing well in radars. You know, mind you, all these SAM systems require good radars. You require a, a long-range surveillance radar, then you require a fire control radar. So all that we have uh, already got and uh, work is improved. I, I can say with pride that missiles and radars, I think India uh, is doing well, including in air-to-air -air missiles. We know the Astra, we know the Ramos air-to-grounds. We, we, we are, I think, doing quite all right. Good to know, sir. I, I wasn't yeah. aware about the yes. India's air defense system. Yes, yes. And uh, so India has also come a long way since independence. It's been about, what, 80 years since since independence. And we've been seeing a gradual inflow of a lot of investment. You said $2.4 trillion is what the world spends on Aero. on on military, Aero, on military yes. and forty percent is aeros aerospace. Yes, how much of that forty percent is by India, sir? Yeah, by you India. know, firstly, I must tell you, as you rightly said, you know, at independence, we were, you know, uh, 20, uh, 250 years back. India and China had nearly fifty percent of the world's GDP, and then uh, the, uh, uh, during the British rule, I think they exploited, they, they took away the raw materials, they didn't build industry here. The industries were building in Europe and the Industrial Revolution had done a great job for them there. So at the time of independence, we were at 0.5% of the world GDP. That's all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm happy to, that uh, you're here today, the fifth uh, largest economy in the world and very close to becoming the third largest in the next two, three years. So uh, I think we have come a long way. Mm -hmm. You know, we Indians have a tendency to keep looking at our own selves with a uh, myopic, uh, so, negative, uh, you know, thoughts and always uh, finding faults with our own self. But I think if you look at the big picture, we are doing 
uh, extremely well in. We are the fourth largest military and mo fourth largest and most powerful military in the world. In fact, they're purely in numbers, the Indian army is the, the largest army in the world, even larger than China. Because yes, Chinese yeah. army has been split into many other forces. True, true. Uh, the total number uh, with, of the armed forces in China may be a little more than India, but we are a huge, uh, uh, you know, we are very close second in numbers uh, mm -hmm. with China uh, overall. Uh, though in uh, power index wise, we are number four and between three and four, there's a little largest yeah. gap. That means because China is, um, you know, doing uh, uh, certainly better than us on that count. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, uh, doing well. Our industry is catching up. We are now having uh, defense exports. We are coming up the ladder in terms of uh, the total exports that we are doing. Defense production is going up 175,000 crores is a good figure uh, for defense out of which 25,000 crores the exports which is going to happen next year. We, we are coming up in a, uh, you know, in a big way. Mm -hmm. now we have made the LCA, which is a big success. It's a modern aircraft. Uh, and uh, if we succeed in LCA Mark II and the AMCA in the uh, times to come, which I'm sure we will, we are on the high table, global high table. Right. We, we have already, uh, you know, uh, earned ourselves a, a place in the UN Security Council, it's uh, just a matter of time that the world will have to announce because they, they, they can't wish away India anymore. Yes. True. true, true. Yeah. So one thing we are missing at the moment in, in air power is the fifth generation jets. Yes. You want to tell me a little more about the fifth generation jets? Yeah, you know, firstly, I must tell you what is a fifth generation jet? Fifth generation jet has uh, certain traits. What what are the important traits is stealth. Mm -hmm. Stealth means it's uh, radar, IR, visual, various uh, signature. Uh, is very low. Uh, very low means um, that a F-35 uh, could have a, you know, uh, radar cross-section equivalent of a tennis ball or something like that, as little as that. The advantage of having low signature is that the enemy sensors will not be able to see you uh, till very close. Mm -hmm. And that close could be that you have already fired your weapon and turned around Mm. And you are not being seen. So therefore, I think uh, fifth generation technologies are important to master. But the other side of it is to make a stealth aircraft very expensive. R&D of years and also to maintain stealth is very expensive, not easy to do. How does it uh, aircraft become stealth? Sir? Yeah, so stealth is uh, done by m many means. First is to uh, design the aircraft at design board stage itself in such a way that its entire mm. body shaping is done, that it has least radar reflective materials. I see, I see. Then you can put additional paints on the, uh, you know, aircraft surface, <laughs> which will absorb the radar energy that's going to impinge on it, uh, the enemy radar. Mm -hmm. Then how you design the intakes that, uh, you know, the, uh, see the engine when it's rotating inside is like a wall. And mm. it is uh, doing reflections, uh, you know, similarly, the exhaust uh, nozzles, uh, they have IR signature, they also have uh, radar uh, reflections. Also, there's some moving parts. If I was to hang tanks or weapons under uh, the belly or the wings, you know, they're, they're all going to add to the signature. So you will have internal base, so you'll have special engines, the engines will be embedded in such a way, the exhaust nozzles, the intakes. There are very many things. Even the canopy of the aircraft will be such that it's not reflecting uh, too much of radar energy or even for that matter. Other. So the, the, this is how the uh, you know stealth aircraft are designed and made. And as I said, it requires years of uh, research. And our own case, we are making the AMCA, which has uh, been approved by the CCS. Uh, the Cabinet Committee on Security has approved uh, X amount of money. It's in public domain. Uh, and uh, work is already on. Mm -hmm. uh, the design is more or less frozen. Uh, the metal cutting has started, but uh, there is a. It takes a long time. We all know that the LCA first flew in 2001, and we are today in 2024. And in 23 years, we have only 40 uh, odd LCAs, uh, you know, with the Air Force mm -hmm. uh, total built, including the test aircraft, are only around 50. So therefore, it takes time. But I am sure that now that India has a financial muscle. Uh, and uh, we have more access to technologies within the country and from abroad. Uh, we will be, uh, we hope that we will be able to hasten 
the LCA, you know, uh, the LCA Mark II and the Amka stealth aircraft. Yeah. How soon, sir, according to you? Yeah, you know, I will tell you, I'll be, I'm a realist, uh, you know, I'm a proud Indian, I'm a nationalist uh, person who, uh, you know, wants uh, India to be proud and optimistic, but I also feel that we must be real. The DRDO, the people who are working on the ADA, who's working on the AMCA, <coughs> they themselves have said uh, first, uh, you know, flight timelines will be past 2030. 2030. Uh, they are talking of uh, servant service induction around 2035. My personal gut feeling is that it could be closer to 2038 that it will have a service induction. And that means... Uh, only 14 years and 14 years is not very long time it's seeing not. the development uh, of the uh, you know the other aircraft that we've had and there are issues you know we haven't uh, we are initially going to fly the amka with the engine with f414g f414 engine uh, which may not be the ultimate engine because we ultimately need a stealthy engine uh, you know on the aircraft so therefore uh, there will be issues we, maybe the first one or two squadrons will be less stealthy than the ones mm. which will follow subsequently. Uh, but so there are issues, but uh, I think that is the kind of uh, timelines, uh, service induction of AMCA, not earlier than 14, 15 years from now. So one way is to uh, <coughs> manufacture our own stealth planes. Another is a technology transfer. Do you, do you speculate in technology transfer from countries like the US or even Russia for that matter? Yeah, you see, there are two aspects to it. Firstly, there are only three countries in the world who have made the fifth generation aircraft. USA, of course, they made the F-22 much earlier, 2005, uh, and the F-35 more recently. But over a thousand F-35s are already flying mm -hmm. in 17 Air Forces of the world, mostly uh, the, uh, their Western allies. Uh, and uh, uh, numbers that will come up in F-35, phenomenal, because the orders are increasing and uh, the production is uh, uh, at a, around 130 to 140 aircraft a year is what is the production currently, okay. F-35. Uh, and maybe they, they'll have to increase it to meet their requirements. Now, uh, the Russian, uh, Americans have not offered uh, F-35, but they, are, they will perhaps offer us some technologies for our arm car. Mm -hmm. Why they have not offered us F-35 is because we have bought the S-400 and uh, the mm -hmm. Americans have said that anybody who buys S-400, we cannot sell the F-35 as they refused to Turkey earlier. Okay. And the reason is uh, because they feel that we, uh, uh, the radar and uh, sensors of S-400 will be able to capture a lot of data of the F-35 and which uh, is not good for them. For them, yes. So this is the current position, but uh, America needs us as much as we need Americans. We need Definitely. their technology. They need us as a friend. Their whole Indo-Pacific strategy yeah. uh, cannot move without India being the main uh, linchpin uh, or the anchor for that strategy. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I have a gut feeling that at some point, we will be able to convince them if we decide as a country that we must have an interim uh, foreign fifth generation aircraft, mm -hmm. maybe two squadrons, four squadrons, till our AMCA becomes fully operational, True. which as I said, would we'll take, take about time. 14 years. Uh, in which case, we the, 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 there could be some back channel negotiations. Mm -hmm. You know, you must remember that we have signed a lot of uh, communication, logistics, uh, agreements, security, agreements with the Americans, True. which forbid us to share uh, information about their systems with anybody else. And that's how we are getting such a large number of aircraft uh, from them. In fact, America-India relation, the main issue is military aviation. Yeah. You know, we bought the C-17, C-130, the P-8I, the Apache, the Chinook, the R-60 uh, helicopter, all major purchases are uh, aviation related, military aviation. So therefore, maybe there is a window. Now, the other windows are uh, the, the Russian. Does Sun Russia have fifth generation jets? Yeah, they have got Su-57. As of today, they have uh, 42 of them. Uh, their production has been slow. Uh, the Russian Air Force has ordered initially about uh, 75 aircraft, 76 to be exact. But can we rely on the Russian Yeah, experience? let me explain. Uh, till now, the production was very slow. They were teething problems. There are some electronics on board, especially in the cockpit and elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, and the radar, which are uh, from Western sources, chips uh, coming from Europe. 
but some of this has uh, so there have been uh, issues for them but the, the uh, russians are now saying that they have resolved they found alternate sources and uh, the su 57 now this year 2024 the company is going to deliver 20 aircraft now if it's 20 aircraft it actually gets delivered uh, by end of this year they will have 42 and after the production uh, stabilizes which their target is to make it about 20 to 24 aircraft every year they have been uh, wooing india you know see india is a huge market we are the fourth largest air force the mm-hmm. chinese are no more interested in russian aircraft because they have become independent of them uh, the, the western world will not buy no other country can afford a fifth generation aircraft the only country that can afford and Indeed. is a friend of russia is india mm-hmm. and therefore you remember many years back we had joined the fifth generation fighter aircraft project with russians but uh, for uh, technical and uh, you know work sharing reasons we had come out of that project in 2018 Six years back, mm-hmm. uh, after having uh, spent nearly two fifty million dollars in it, right. but we walked out of that uh, project because uh, <laughs> the requirements of Russia, the Russian econ- Russian economy, and various other uh, things were uh, reducing the scale of the whole project. But things are changing now. You know the Russians. So Russians are still wooing us in the last Aero India, last uh, uh, you know. Uh, defense expo they have been coming and talking and hinting that okay our problems have been solved we will we should uh, go back to them but that's a uh, issue that needs much more greater deliberation discussion because we have a, the other reason why we um, i'm not sure if we should go to the russian side is because 60% of indian air force is already of russian already origin russian. <laughs> we want to put more eggs in the same basket is an issue ultimately the best basket for india will be indian basket yep. which yep. i hope that in next 15 20 years becomes closer to 40% with more lcas uh, you mm-hmm. know and other uh, aircraft uh, coming in while we are working towards that atmanirbharta which is crucial if you right. want to be a superpower you have to be atam nirbhar in defense for sure there is no doubt about that so what we require to do is to identify uh, do we go the russian way for two squadrons if at all we have to go third country is china so we can't we buy can't. from there so that is out yet another option which i have been uh, considering and writing about is to have a non stealth uh, option with larger numbers for example rafal rafal is a front hemisphere mm. Yeah, you know, stealth aircraft, 4.5 generation, and the French Air Force has decided that their own sixth generation aircraft, the FCAS, a future combat air system, uh, which they are doing jointly with the uh, some European countries, has got delayed. So they have coming out with better versions of the Rafale. The Rafale F4 is entering the French Air Force. The Rafale F5 will be a much advanced. Very, they would have imbibed a large number of fifth generation technologies. One choice is that in any case, Indian Air Force is short of fighter aircraft squadrons. You know, we are down to 31 fighter squadrons mm-hmm. instead of 42, is and it? our own, uh, which is the authorized figure, and our own uh, production numbers of the LCA Mark One and Two are still, uh, you know, to catch up. Mm-hmm. and we required in in term some uh, you know squadrons uh, to be imported and the indian air force has been talking about uh, 114 uh, mrfa aircraft for last 6 years mm-hmm. but the uh, request for formal proposal has not yet gone out so one possibility is that either we must get a fifth generation aircraft two three squadrons four squadrons from uh, either the americans or the mm-hmm. russians or we induct more high quality rafale variants Mm-hmm. like the f5 so how the uh, architecture works out uh, how the uh, india security establishment looks at this whole uh, thing would have to be i must mention that the pakistanis have already announced they are already talking to the chinese mm-hmm. uh, for the j31 j31 is a smaller uh, fifth generation aircraft of the chinese which is already flying but uh, work is still to happen more work has to happen mm-hmm. and uh, the pakistan is also very closely working with the the turkish the turkey has also got a fifth generation uh, program which is just started the first flight has just is taken it? place mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it's so uh, looks somewhat like the f35 and uh, the pakistani technicians 200 of them are sitting in that uh, turkish uh, aerospace industry right now uh, working jointly with them so there is a possibility <coughs> that the uh, pakistanis might manage to get their uh, fifth generation fighter before either us. from china or from turkey before us and that will mm-hmm. be a very embarrassing position so, so therefore so. we have to you know get our act right 
uh, while we accelerate AMCA, we must also see if we have to have an alternate uh, option. Yeah. So you mentioned France as an option for 4.5 generation. Uh, the, our NSA Ajit Ji had a de- went to France and made a deal. Do you think that deal would uh, comprehend? No, I am not sure what exactly the deal because the, in public domain it is not very clear. Yes, what has happened is that the Indian Navy is going to get 26 uh, Rafal M. M is the marine version okay. of the Rafal. Now, I have always believed that you know we already have so many types of fighters in the Air Force. We mm. can't keep having another, another, another inventory. I was going to come to uh, that. We have got 36 uh, Rafals in the Air Force. We have got two fighter bases. We have got place for more bases we have already paid one time uh, you know india specific modifications we have already paid for it so it is uh, india must take a call that if we are going ahead for 26 rafal m for the navy and if we were to uh, do that 114 also in a government to government deal with france we'll get a better deal maybe we'll be able to cut down the price subsequently also to make in india will be so much easier because we will have the advantage of numbers if mm-hmm. 114 plus 26 means 140 aircraft you is the worthwhile number to make in india right so therefore this is an option that we perhaps need to you know look at, look at very seriously and i'm sure people in the security establishment are, are aware of and conscious of uh, this as an option uh, you know, to be exercised by by the country. So, as you said, uh, the NSA had gone to uh, France, and I'm sure some. Uh, uh, of course, in that uh, visit, uh, the much bigger issue was also to discuss about make in India a, a for India engine with mm. Indian uh, intellectual property rights. Yeah. So while India has come a long way, we still lack a lot of uh, public-private partnership. Yeah. In terms of technological advancement, research and development, what would you say would be the solution to that, sir? Because we've been seeing that India is lacking in terms of R&D at the moment, sir. Yeah, see, first thing I must tell you that the government of India, and I've said with great pride that the way they are driving Atam Nirbharta, it's really, really very serious. And especially in defense, you know, there are very clear instructions to DRDO that everything has to be now open to private sector. Means all the technologies you are developing, develop, find private partners and put them, join them with you. Mm-hmm. So that is one. That is DRDO, all the public sector defense companies, they are all being asked to get more and more items that you, you know, must be sourced from within the country and to take. You know, I am also happy to say that, you know, Adhani is a big company with lots of money, one of the biggest uh, industrial houses, they are making UAVs and they didn't wait for Indian orders. They started making UAVs, there is a joint venture with Elbit in Hyderabad and uh, their UAVs are being sold around the world, including to the Israelis. So that means the big Tatas are huge. You know, they're making F-16 wings, they're making C, uh, C-130 fuselage, they're making uh, the cabin of the Apache, they are making large number of systems for global customers. That means the capability and a large number of private companies. You know, there's a private company which makes Su-30 wings and mm. fins. There are private companies which are making LCA, central fuselage, front fuselage and rear fuselage. They are all, we, we know their names, they are in public domain. So there is a lot of work going on uh, today in, in, in private sector. Private sector is also e- easier for them to raise money. They, they just need hand-holding. They need mm-hmm. uh, some confirmed orders so that they can raise the money. And uh, it is already decided that in AMCA, we are going to have, a, it, it's going to be HAL, ARA and a private partner. Hmm. It, it is already decided. It's now CE295 is being built in India by Tata's. It's a private company. And uh, we, we, initially only 40 aircraft uh, are going to come, uh, have been ordered, but uh, they could tomorrow be much larger numbers in, uh, later on with more variants. So therefore, uh, private sector important. And I must also tell you, you know, in the government sector, the salaries are as per the government structure. Mm-hmm. That means the head of the RDO cannot get more than the cabinet secretary of the country. So therefore, and the similarly, there is a structure down below. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you really want good talent and good uh, CEOs and good, uh, you know, uh, uh, corporate culture, then you have to, uh, the corporates have an advantage. They're easier for them to get technologies from abroad. So there is a need for a max, uh, mix and match, which I'm proud to say that that process has started and it is evolving. And I'm sure that in coming times, 
private sector will be big. You see in drone, uh, drones, you know, uh, there are more than a hundred drone startups. Mm. Bulk of the orders in drones are all going to small companies, uh, startup companies, and they, they, they're all, uh, you know, trying to uh, quickly indigenize most of the stuff that they are trying to sell. So I think we are on a good track. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Good yeah. to hear that, sir. Yeah. So when we speak about Indian Air Force, we often neglect their, their soft power. Their soft power when it comes to nation building. Uh, you recently wrote a art, beautiful article that I read as well, which inspired this conversation. Yeah. Uh, would you want to share a little bit more about what Indian Air Force does for India's nation building? I must first tell you that, you know, India is a peace loving country. If you see 5000 years of Indian history, we have not gone invading other people's lands. Mm. Uh, we have spread uh, uh, happiness, value systems, religion, culture. You see Buddhism left from India and then whole of China, Japan, Southeast Asia, Hinduism went right up to uh, Indonesia from here. So uh, we have been a peace living country and we have propounding that world is a family. We saw that we, the way we encourage the whole world to get together in G20 and everybody looks up to us. Similarly, our armed forces, uh, you know, service before self. That is the mm. motto, the uh, uh, political, secular Indian armed forces, very high level of discipline, professionalism. You know, you see from, uh, uh, you know, the Mediterranean till Southeast Asia. True. How many real democracies? Only one. Real big democracy, India. So therefore, uh, you know, we can say with the pride that uh, we, 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 we are uh, Indian armed forces. Now look at this soft bar. You know, we are called defense forces. Mm -hmm. We are here to defend this country defend its integrity from foreign invasion, from internal security, from all points of view and see the kind of contribution that uh, Indian armed forces are making all the time. Uh, look at uh, the disaster relief, mm -hmm. you know, humanitarian assistance disaster relief, whether it was COVID, whether it's earthquake in Nepal, Sikkim, yeah. whether it's cyclones which are taking place all the time, whether there are floods. Of course, luckily, India is not having droughts now because we have crossed uh, that uh, you know point. The way we rescue people in the mountains, yeah. the way we are supporting the civilian population in snowbound Kashmir and some other areas, mm -hmm. the way we set up uh, you know uh, the hospitals in Turkey during the earthquake, the way Indian armed forces evacuated people from Sudan, from Yemen, from you know d d different countries. Afghanistan. What happened? What we did in COVID. How the Indian Air Force put the entire transport fleet to move oxygen uh, trucks, mm -hmm. you know, empty oxygen trucks to, so that they can be filled up quickly and driven back here. How we are giving aid, how we, for each cyclone, how the Indian Air Force is moving NDRF teams yeah. and the Army teams to quick locations through. And we have a sizable, uh, you know, C-17 is a Globe, Globe Master, is a huge aircraft, IL-76. We have a sizable transport and helicopter fleet. And it's only growing with C, uh, you know, uh, 295 com coming up. So therefore, I think Indian armed forces are doing a tremendous job. You know, they're helping Kashmiri women deliver children. Mm. You know, they, uh, when a doctor can't reach them because the army is sitting there. So therefore, we are uh, doing also defense diplomacy. You know, the large number of foreigners are training in our academies. Our attaches are doing diplomacy there, making friends. <laughs> Uh, our Navy is doing port calls. Indian Air Force and Army Navy are doing air access and other exercises with a large number of uh, the countries in the world. You know, the number of air uh, military exercise that we are doing in the last uh, three years is equivalent to what we did in the, our, all the years before, uh, since independence. This is the kind of engagement we are doing. True. It's important from interoperability uh, point of view, but it's also soft power. We are making friends. A mm. squadron leader uh, makes a friend with a major from another country. When they'll grow up and become air marshals and generals, uh, they, 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 they'll be an asset to each other. They'll correspond with each other. So like that, people who come to NDC and staff college to, to training mm -hmm. and into various academies of the three services, there, there, there are bondings and this is a, 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 a tremendous amount of, you know, software, the military is doing a, a, a part of a nation building all the time. And uh, see the kind of pride the countrymen have. Mm. I mean, if you, all the surveys are clearly pointing out that the Indian military is, is the most respected institution in the country. So that itself shows uh, that how we are, and Sagar, 
security around us, you know, with the initiative of the Prime Minister, that we are going to look after the security of the region. We, we are supporting Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, you know, Maldives. Mm -hmm. uh, we we help them get out of a coup. We, we subsequently, in their water crisis, we, uh, you know, dumped a, a few hundred thousands of uh, drinking water with them. And notwithstanding the little the differences that we might have had with them uh, in the recent because of a change of government, but we are already seeing that their their prime minister has come again, uh, the president has come again to sort of uh, seek India's help because they can't live without us because we are right. uh, the security and uh, assistance providers in this region. So I think uh, India is uh, you know, Indian soft power, military power is doing exceptionally well, and we all the air force, of course. As the Sarang and Surya Kiran teams, which are going around the world at air shows and otherwise displays mm -hmm. to promote uh, the professionalism and skills of the Indian Armed Forces, yes. So, do you think there's, there has been a transition in terms of, uh, I mean, that's climate change also is, is a problem at the moment, yeah. like you mentioned in your article. Yeah. Uh, what kind of initiative is the IAF taking in terms of changing the way they use their resources? Yeah, you know, climate change, not many people till very recently were very clear that climate change and security have a direct linkage. You know, climate change, if the coastal areas, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the sea uh, level rises, coastal areas, uh, uh, you know, get uh, covered up, the land, the mangroves go, the people migrate inwards, uh, migrations have their implications, they could be drought somewhere, they could be excessive flooding, all these calls for migrations. If the Himalayas will be renewed, there will be shortage of water. Tomorrow there will be water war in the region. We all know that two years back the Pakistanis had flood. One third of the country was uh, underwater. So my condition is climate change uh, has its uh, dynamics and climate change and we have become conscious. Now, mind you, the uh, aviation contributes only 2% of the global uh, carbon emissions. Carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. 60% is contributed for generating electricity. You must know. Yeah. No, ordinary people don't understand this. Mm -hmm. Everybody is all the time po pointing at aviation. But, but the aircraft emits a lot of carbon as well. Yeah, How it do you does. But that's why I'm saying that all aircraft, military and civil put together the world, only total emission is 2%. But even in there, we are going for hybrid fuels. <laughs> you know, the Indian Air Force has uh, uh, already tested mm -hmm. uh, on AN-32 hybrid fuel. That means uh, not necessarily a fossil fuel, but a fuel which is generated from bio. Uh, you know, uh, yes. So, mm -hmm. like that, we are now look at this. Each of the airfields are, are an ecosystem by itself. You know, every airfield we have uh, solar systems. Well, you know, the, 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 the first uh, one of the biggest case was of uh, the Kochi International Airport, which we, totally, uh, you know, uh, more than 100%. Electricity consumption is from solar. So, uh, Indian armed forces are much more conscious. Mm -hmm. They are doing waste management, electronic waste management, the waste management oils and lubricants because our aeroplanes use them. And uh, we are uh, uh, trying to help the country in getting alternate uh, energy sources. So, I think we are extremely uh, conscious, the militaries are. You know, the Indian Army is cleaning up high mountain areas where expeditions are going. They are cleaning up uh, places around them, especially true, so. True. Siachen Glacier, huge initiative by the Indian Army to pick up waste, uh, clear the uh, place. So, we are very environment uh, conscious, yeah. In terms of commercial flying for us civilians, uh, I'm sure you follow a lot of new trends <laughs> and technology advancement. What, how, how do you see the future of air transport, uh, transport would be? Yeah, you know, civil aviation is the fastest growing sector. In India? The world. The world. But in India, is faster than everybody else in the world. Is you it know, because of the population? The, population, uh, of course, a larger number of people growing into mm -hmm. middle class. Middle <clears throat> class can afford to travel by air. Mm -hmm. uh, as the economy goes up and the population, we are number one population in the world today. So therefore, is civil aviation. Now, in civil aviation, the initiatives are much higher. You know, it's cost. You have to reduce cost. Uh, you have to, uh, and plus there are international uh, norms that have been set for reducing carbon emissions. So the engines have to be more efficient. They, they'll mm. save them, the company, the fuel. You know, big chunk of the operating costs, the fuel, yeah. you know, for the airline. Mm. So the engines are becoming much, much uh, more uh, efficient world over uh, for, for the airliners. And, uh, you know, whole ecosystem at the airport. It, it, it's not just the fuel. Uh, there's noise pollution. 
you know when the mm. approach path there are the colonies below you you have to make sure that the the paths that the aeroplane follows during approach is steeper efficient is, as well and uh, has a less noise at those mm. low uh, you know power figures so you have to look at uh, you have to look at the approach roads to the um, airports because uh, they, they are going to cause pollution mm -hmm. you know so the, 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 you have to look at a very very big ecosystem and i must tell you uh, as the battery technologies have started improving uh, there will be more electrical aircraft in times to come hybrid fuel hydrogen based fuel hydrogen all mm -hmm. coming in a big way <laughs> urban air mobility is going to be mostly battery linked and uh, therefore uh, in times to come the uh, civil aviation is very conscious of uh, uh, not only cost cutting but also uh, cutting uh, em emissions in a big way you mm -hmm. know at the amount of uh, waste that gets generated at a civil airport like uh, indira gandhi international airport phenomenal yes so number of people eating there number of electronics uh, that are being used uh, and the oil and lubricants and the everybody is operating battery operated uh, buses on an airport you know there is no vehicle in the airport which is now fuel based mostly they are all yeah. battery because uh, mm -hmm. again everybody is conscious so i think civil aviation is uh, uh, will make sure that the you know the uh, environment part is looked after yeah what do you take on the flying cars that we speculate in the future so yeah that's what i said urban air mobility you know not only urban air mobility which the prime minister has said that in next two years we will have urban air mobility it means i should be able to go from gurgaon to faridabad not a helicopter maybe a drone drone kind or of a kind of a vehicle and um, you know, dubai is already tested without a pilot I meant unmanned air mobility so therefore and there are regulations being worked out dgc already given out guidelines for urban air mobility i, I mean uh, why should i spend 3 hours to go to sonipat from gurgaon yeah of course uh, they they, mm -hmm. they are making express ways for that but uh, i should be able to go by you know air and uh, things are being put in place yeah beautiful sir yeah. Uh, the future seems very exciting uh, i want to end our conversation with posing a question towards you sir in terms of <laughs> india's national security if you were the air chief at the moment sir what kind of changes in policy would you would suggest to the higher management you know um, <laughs> that that is lacking according to you at the moment yeah no no firstly i'm not the ac but i also know that the uh, present ac great professional and also the national security system they are conscious and aware of everything all that we retired people are trying to do is uh, to contribute by through our writings through our research we, we have more time mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to do the hand holding for the government Uh, at uh, all the time and of course there are three areas which the air force is uh, 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 been concerned for some time one is to get the fighter squadron numbers up mm -hmm. uh, to 42 and do it very very quickly because we have two formidable neighbors they are peer competitors they are nuclear powered they have we have serious boundary disputes with them we have had wars with them and uh, so we have a two front uh, war scenario which the parliament has acknowledged so therefore Uh, if that be the case the first is capability building for which indian air force requires uh, you know fighter aircraft uh, in numbers to match uh, the guys you remember that uh, i must mention that the chinese are going to have 1000 uh, j20s by 2035 wow. and our amca will not be inducted by then and if that be the figures we have to uh, quickly get our numbers in we also need um, um, uh, more uh, flight refuelers air airborne flight refuelers and evacs for which work is already in progress orders have been placed they are being well uh, but uh, we have to do it very much faster because these are three we are quite well off in transport and helicopter fleets we are well off in radars and missiles of course we have to do a greater stocking of um, ammunition as we've seen that supply chains could be an issue and therefore there is a requirement for greater you know a uh, stocking of munitions uh, drones is where the action is again larger number of inventories are required for uh, kamikaze type of drones unmanned system we already committed to the predator we also have the heron uh, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, aircraft from the israeli side uh, uavs and uh, indian uavs are coming up in larger numbers uh, the adhani has already got an order for hums 900 and some smaller drones mm -hmm. uh, from the armed forces so therefore uh, generally we are okay but as i said fighter squadrons uh, you know evacs and uh, fras are three areas where we need to 
uh, you know, uh, hasten, if I may use the word, for plans which are already unfolding. Yeah. And that can be supported by indigenous manufacturing or Atmanurur thought, like you said, is quite strong in terms of defense manufacturing. And Absolutely. That's what we need to and, uh, you know, in Atmanurur Bhatta, for us to succeed, there are areas where we need technologies. But I'm happy that right up to the Prime Minister, when he goes to US and to some of the Western countries, he's directly speaking to the company heads, CEOs, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is outstanding for a leader of his stature to do is to get these people to come and invest in India and help us uh, in technology. And in the process, they will get a market, uh, which is uh, very important. But uh, more than that, uh, India needs to spend much more on R&D. You know, we spend only 0.6% of uh, the GDP uh, on R&D, the total R&D, not just the defense. The Americans spent 3.6% of GDP. The Chinese spent 2.6% of their GDP on R&D. So we certainly need to go up from 0 0.6 to maybe 1.5 or some a figure a percentage <laughs> on R&D because still you have intellectual property. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're good for nothing True. because the, the people who have intellectual property, they, 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 they can, uh, you know, command and demand what they want. There's we, no reliance yeah, on the international yeah, powers. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. So like you said, we need, we, we are at the right time pace, but we need to improve our uh, indigenous manufacturing. So to end this conversation, allow me to ask you a personal question. That is, what piece of advice would you give to your younger self, a younger Air Marshal Anil Chopra? <laughs> yeah, you know, at 72, uh, it, it, technically I might be old, but I, I'm very proud to say that, you know, the amount of work I'm doing right now. Uh, is perhaps more than what I was doing even when I was in uniform. Uh, because uh, God has been kind, I am maintaining, I mean, I, I hope I continue to have the energy uh, and the uh, health to continue with, with the enthusiasm. You know, I, I have two words I must tell your young people is, I strongly believe in two words in which I have luckily imbibed is passion and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that I do, even including what, when I'm talking to you right now, uh, I do it with great amount of passion and enthusiasm. And I think this is very, very important. Uh, we in the military also want the young people to be more disciplined mm -hmm. uh, because uh, discipline, uh, you know, shows up in everything that you do in your, you know, main professional work. But the, the discipline, it's, uh, it's a way of life for us. And I think uh, that's all I would like to advise because you guys, the new generation is much smarter. You've got a much better exposure. Uh, you, you know, your experiences are so much uh, different. Uh, but I think these are two, three values which will see you through, uh, you know, even better. Yeah. That reflects on your aura as well. So you've been keeping yourself so busy and intact as well in terms of health. Thank you. Thank you. So, so this has been a very insightful conversation for me. Thank you so much for spending the time. And I'm sure the audience had a lot to take from our conversation today as well. Thank you so much for spending the time again, sir. Thank you, Shivam. And pleasure. God bless you and keep uh, doing up the great work you are doing. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. We at TOAP are working really hard to take this podcast to the next level. Our guests are going to get even better. Our production quality is going to get even better. And hopefully, I'm going to get even better too. Most importantly, we are committed to being consistent and continue to do what we love the most. Until then, keep reimagining yourself and know that the power of change lies within you. Jai Hind.